Hello, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. My name is Luke Boyd. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at Historic Richmond Town. Welcome to our first in a series called Richmond Town Talks. This program is on the Quarantine War of 1858. This program explores the history of quarantine facilities on Staten Island. In the 19th century, Staten Island was home to several sites of quarantine designed to control the spread of infectious diseases. In Tompkinsville, near the site of today's Staten Island Ferry, a large quarantine hospital facility was built to house arriving immigrants stricken with contagious illnesses. Local residents disliked having the facility nearby, and on the nights of September 1st and 2nd, 1858, a mob stormed the quarantine. After evacuating the patients, several of the buildings were set ablaze. In this current moment of city, state, and national lockdowns and social distancing due to COVID-19, the story of the quarantine fire and the quarantine wars is especially relevant. I would like to introduce two special speakers, two staff members from Historic Richmond Town, who will help us understand this story. Ian Hagens is a historic interpreter at Historic Richmond Town. He is a graduate of Rowan University with interests in social dynamics and criminal history. Jeff Caverly is a local historian, blacksmith, high school science teacher, and seventh generation Staten Islander. And now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Hagens and Jeff Caverly. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Luke. Uh, welcome to this digital conversation. My name is Ian Hagens. I am a historical interpreter at Historic Richmond Town. And I am joined today by Jeff Caverly. If you're familiar with Historic Richmond Town, you may recognize him as the town's long-standing blacksmith. Jeff is an authority on many historical subjects and wrote an article on the quarantine fire in the Staten Island Historian, a journal published by the Staten Island Historical Society. A digital download of this winter 2009 edition, which features Jeff's Quarantine Wars article, will be made available on Historic Richmond Town's website and social channels following this presentation. Jeff, tell us about how you became interested in the story and the research you did in order to write your article. Well, as a seventh generation Staten Islander, I feel a deep attachment to the island, its people, its stories in general. I always look for those little hidden gems on our island. And around 2008, uh, having heard the quarantine story many of times, I was wanting to celebrate in some way the 150th anniversary of this very, very di dynamic tale in our island's history and evolution. So we were working out the details at that time for the Staten Island Historian, which had been recently brought back, and we decided to publish an article about it uh, to celebrate the anniversary, the history, and to kind of update the articles that had been written uh, back in the 50s and 60s on the same topic. And so, uh, what diseases were being contained in the quarantine that New York City had to worry about in the 18th century and 19th century? Um, there were a number of them. Uh, the more prevalent ones that were being worried about at the time were yellow fever, particularly. Uh, there's a lot of cartoons and etches of the time period dealing with yellow fever or yellow jack, as it was nicknamed. Uh, smallpox. Uh, Asiana, cholera, uh, and then a various assortment of other diseases that are way too exotic and way too numerous to name. So when was this quarantine commission to be built? What was its intended role for the Port of New York? Uh, originally, the quarantine was commissioned in 1799 as a means of shielding the harbor from any diseases actually even coming into the port uh, was being purposely put on that particular site for the reason that historically ships had been there since docking there for the 1600s to pick up fresh water as the flat first and last place before you went out to sea that was really available. Uh, so seeing that it was already kind of an established gateway to the harbor, the fact that it was a common stop 
for shipping in general, this looked like an ideal place. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, and fortunately in many ways, Paul Michu, who was Staten Island's representative up in Albany, along with a lot of Staten Islanders, did not want to see this happen. So Paul Michu, being the representative up in the, sit, up in the state, actually blocked the sale of the land from Dr. Richard Bailey, okay, who was become one of the earliest directors of the institution, uh, starting in 1801, when finally everything got cleared out. So the quarantine inevitably did go through. So on screen, we actually have the burial plot of Richard Bailey, Dr. Richard Bailey. Uh, and on the left here is the church at which he's buried outside of, correct? St. Andrew's Cemetery, yes. He, his family has a corner plot there. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is not only is Dr. Richard Bailey one of the founders of the quarantine, uh, as you can even see here, uh, it says that his life was terminated of great usefulness on August 17th, 1801. Uh, so he didn't live too much through the actual operation of the quarantine, at least in the capacity of this particular hospital, but he was one among its first victims. Wow. So the first year it was open, it took the life of the man who essentially founded it. Mm -hmm. So why was the specific location chosen as the site of the quarantine hospital? Well, as far as that goes, I, again, ships were kind of docking in that particular area as a place to get fresh water okay, as they were going out to sea or pick up fresh water as they were coming in. Also, being a part of the Narrows area of Staten Island, it's a natural gateway for entering New York Harbor. Uh, approaching New York Harbor has always been very cantankerous when it comes to sandbars and offshore features. Uh, it takes a very skilled pilot, even to this day, to navigate what is known as Ambrose Channel. So the Narrows is really one of the very few ways of the time period that you could really successfully get into New York Harbor easy. So since this was the entrance point and we wanted to prevent disease from actually getting into the harbor, this was an ideal place. So they saw land that was for sale in the area. And by sheer coincidence at that time, a piece of land known as Duxbury Globe that was owned by St. Andrew's Church. Uh, they were looking actually to sell it at that particular time. Uh, and so it was kind of like a match made in heaven okay, in terms of actually establishing a quarantine, even though it may not have been so heavenly for Staten Islanders. Mm. It was almost like a perfect coincidence, a perfect storm to get it uh, built in this specific spot. Yeah, perfect storm would actually be the perfect word for it. <laughs> So what did this facility look like? What buildings did it have on its property? Okay. It had numerous hospitals um, to kind of give some modern day markers of where it would extend to, for those uh, familiar with Staten Island. It would extend all the way from the waterfront all the way up to St. Mark's Place in the north-south direction. And in terms of east and west, it would encompass from about Hyatt Avenue, okay, which abuts both the east wall of Borough Hall and the west wall of St. George Library, all the way over to Arietta Avenue at the time. Okay, Arietta Avenue was modern day Victory Boulevard and then extended all the way back down to the water. As far as buildings that were found on the property uh, and kind of general layout of where they were, uh, the smallpox hospital was closer to the side where we would now have the St. George Library, about 200 feet off of Hyatt Avenue. You would have had St. Nicholas Hospital, okay, the largest of the buildings, in approximately the position of Cargo Cafe today. Uh, you had the phys physicians' homes okay, over towards Ariat Avenue, and where our present day courthouses, the one that was just constructed okay, in the early 2000s, okay, this is actually where the cemetery would have been. Okay? There's actually a marker there now. But back in 2000, 
the early 2000s, they actually did an excavation there to make sure that they had not disturbed it. And just a small distance from that would have been the smallpox hospital. The wharfs and piers, those would have occupied areas near the National Lighthouse Museum. Okay, as you can see on this map, you can see a small section marked off as wharf and pier and sold to the United States government. Uh, that would be that the Lighthouse Museum that we're all familiar with today that still has some of the historic buildings still standing. Very interesting. And I like to point out in this uh, lithograph here we have this map we have a smallpox hospital and a uh, yellow fever hospital, both labeled on the map itself. So it's showing the, that this hospital facility is made up of smaller hospitals for uh, intended diseases that are being treated. Yes. In this point. Even besides the smallpox hospital, okay, directly to the right of it, uh, it's a little bit blurry in this particular rendering. Okay, that was a even smaller hospital. That was um, the North Hospital at the time. Um, and there's also another noted hospital. The North Hospital? North Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, was another small facility. Oh, okay. And the hospital that is literally marked hospital on this map, that was the female hospital. That was one of the harder ones that would really kind of withstand the mob for a little bit. And this is just some of the views that we Staten Islanders are kind of very familiar with in terms of what would be the quarantine grounds these days. So we're all pretty well familiar with the Cargo Cafe. Okay, at some point in time, we've all probably played trivia there at some point on a Sunday night uh, on the corner of Slauson and Bay Street. And this other photo here represents what would have been the lower quarantine grounds. Okay, where a lot of the smaller hospitals and wharfs, coffin buildings, uh, physicians, residents would have all been. But more on Staten Island. What was the local reaction to having this facility on the island? What made the quarantine problematic for the general public? So even before the quarantine was constructed, Staten Island really wanted to have absolutely no part of this quarantine facility. Uh, being imposed on them on the island. Uh, this is really seen in the actions of Paul Michu, who objected up in Albany. But even after his objections were noted but overruled by the state, uh, town meetings were a common occurrence throughout the island, especially after the ver each of the epidemics that had broken out on the island. And along those same lines as well with that, um, we have petitions being levied to all the various levels of government, okay, both local, state, and federal, as they try to reach out and just try to get the attention of anyone associated with the quarantine and how to get it moved to a different site okay, over, consistently over a 50-year period. As this facility remained in operation for decades, there were several attempts made to relocate the quarantine off of Staten Island. Legislation was introduced, but never enacted, to move the facility to a small spit of land off of New Jersey's coast, known then and now as Sandy Hook. A committee in, in the state Senate ruled that the quarantine was a hazard to the health of the citizens of the North Shore. Plans were also made to move the quarantine to the south shore of Staten Island. But that also did not come to fruition. Why was that, Jeff? Okay. Well, to start off with the first part of your question about Sandy Hook, okay, attempts were made as early as about 1849 to try to move it to Sandy Hook uh, and get it into an even more isolated area as well as even further away from New York City Harbor in the sense that um, Sandy Hook is further out on Ambrose Channel than even Staten Island is. But unfortunately, it was blocked by state of New Jersey who kind of did a roundabout way of saying no to New York. So instead of saying it directly, the state legislation decided that they would ask New York State for such a high rent that it would become prohibitive for New York State to say yes. In terms of the second moving, 
uh, which was a tried about eight years later in 1857, okay, to the south shore of Staten Island, okay, to Wolf's Farm. They were trying to build a site down there. Uh, they were able to start building wooden frames. They've got some foundations in, but unfortunately at that particular time, what wound up happening was the South Shore citizens of Staten Island saw kind of what their North Shore counterparts were going through. Not wanting to have to deal with this same experience themselves okay, and kind of with um, almost a modern day nimby attitude, uh, they decided to burn it down even before the project could really get started. So what little wooden frames and foundations were completely and utterly destroyed. And was anyone ever uh, arrested or convicted for any sort of arson that took place here? Um, there was a minor investigation, but no, no one was ever charged with the burning of it. Okay. Jeff, tell us about the series of events that leads us into the beginning of September 1858. Okay. So one of the most obvious of all the reasons why the quarantine was burned down were the various outbreaks on Staten Island. Okay? Even in the very first year of the quarantine opening in 1801, okay, there was a small epidemic on Staten Island where 25 people were actually infected with yellow fever. Okay, and out of that 25 people, only one would wind up surviving the uh, epidemic of that time. Then, not too long after, in 1821, okay, a strong gale comes in, and not only does it blow down the wooden wall that is currently separating quarantine from the residents of Tompkinsville, allowing anyone who really wanted to escape the quarantine to do so, but it also blew several ships that were in containing infected cargo right onto the shores of Staten Island and Stranding. So this kind of really didn't go over very well. In less than 10 years, 1832 and again in 1834, major epidemics of Asiatic cholera broke out. And again in 1848, we have yet again yellow fever rearing its head. This time with enlarging populations, we have about estimates indicate between 150 and 180 people infected with the disease at that time. Uh, and 30 would ultimately wind up dying. But kind of the last straw that broke the camel's back that in terms of infection cave really came in 1856 when we had the largest of all the epidemics that broke out. This time we were at 530 infected, not just in Staten Island, but also in Brooklyn and Long Island and a very small portion in lower Manhattan. So, seeing that the South Shore counterparts had kind of gotten away with burning the quarantine down to the ground, even before it was built down there, the North Shore counterparts kind of thought, hey, if they could get away with it, so can we. And it was on this basis that they started planning in secret meetings and in public, okay, as it kind of grew in momentum. The first order of business being setting up a legal, legal justification for the process. So looking at the original charter of the quarantine from 1799, they discovered a line in there that stated that if the government was not rectifying problems or hardships that the quarantine was creating on the citizens of Tompkinsville, then the citizens themselves may actually take it into their own hands to correct the problem. Right? And to this end, it doesn't specify any limit to that. So Tompkinsville residents, as well as any resident in North Shore that was involved, really kind of wanted to make a statement here. So they took the most extreme one possible. Mm. Along those same lines as well, okay, now that they have their kind of plan of action, okay, now it's actually putting it into play. So they start gathering materials such as large pieces of woods that could be fashioned into battering rams, okay, leaving them right against the quarantine's walls, okay, for several days, gathering any kind of flammable material that they can find. The most common ones that were cited in a lot of the research were caffeine and straw, which would have been readily available at the time period. So with that uh, wording they were looking at, they had in their mind a legal justification for 
uh, burning down and going into this quarantine? Yes. So just because the South, the people of the South Shore were in charge, this was going to be a much more extreme act. It was a populated hospital, not one that was under construction and vacant. So mm -hmm. just in the event that any particular person was charged, they did want to have a backup plan. <laughs> So all of this leads us to the night of September 1st. Jeff, can you lead us through that night? Mm -hmm. So at the prearranged destinations that were agreed upon in these various meetings, uh, particularly up in Castleton Corners and near the property of Dr. Westervelt in what would be uh, New Brighton these days, uh, you had crowds of people meeting up and slowly they marched towards the quarantine in Tompkinsville, okay, gathering more and more people. And also these people brought additional supplies with them. When they finally reached the quarantine ground, they dove into the supplies that they had left behind in the days leading up to it, including the battering rams, and stormed the gates. The gates eventually did give way, okay, and they made their way onto the property. Now, initially speaking, there wasn't much alarm raised as this mob actually approached the quarantine. But once they made it in, okay, it became kind of a question of, okay, what are all these people here to do? So, the mob first went off to the smallpox hospital, one of the most feared diseases of the time period. And their first order of business was actually to remove the patients from the building. So they brought them out on stretches, they brought them out on mattresses, placed them at, out in the lawns. And then once the building was seen to be clear, they took all their flammable materials and they started lighting it up on fire. Once this building was on fire, now the quarantine officials are clearly aware of what is going to happen here. So they raise a general alarm throughout the facility. They try to get some of the fire brigades involved as well. but a lot of the mob people were actually wearing firemen's gear. They, it's unknown whether some of them were actually from the fire department and chose to participate in the act or not, mm -hmm. or if it was just kind of camouflage. But as the building is burning, they started chanting, save the smallpox hospital. It was kind of a way of not only confusing the officials as to what was going to happen, but also in terms of the crowd, naming the next target. <laughs> so with the smallpox hospital now entirely engulfed in flames, okay, now they started chanting Saint Nick, Save St. Nicholas Hospital, one of the bigger facilities that they had there. And again, the process repeated itself. Okay? All the patients were carefully removed, okay, stretchers, mattresses, the like. Any mm -hmm. remaining mattresses were piled up. They would be doused with straw, and caffeine and then lit on fire. And by the end of the night, okay, not only was the smallpox in St. Nicholas Hospital on fire, but also a barn, coal house, wagon house, coffin building, all, most of the physician's residence, which they could, took extremely personally in later testimony. Uh, and they did make attempt to destroy the female hospital, but the female hospital kind of held up to the first night's attacks for the simple reason that unlike all the other buildings which were constructed of wood, this one was constructed of brick. So it withstood the initial uh, camphene and mattress uh, arsonists. Yes. That and also by this point in time, if you factor in how long it takes to remove all the patients from these buildings, okay, make sure that they're in a safe way, uh, safe distance and then to actually light a building on fire. It's not something like what you see in the movies where it just catches instantly. Okay? Mm -hmm. Anyone who's ever lit a fire before knows that it takes a while. Mm. Um, and not only do they have that against them and the construction material, but they also have the fact that, okay, they're starting to lose nightfall now. It's now becoming daytime. Their identities are going to start to become easier to pick out. So it's getting near time to retreat from the quarantine. And Jeff, how large of a crowd was involved in this uh, burning? This uh, it, it depends on the historical account that you uh, reference. Some have it as little as 300. Some put it at over 1,000. Uh, wow. 
in modern day, it would be quite difficult to actually really discern what the true number was. My guess is it probably was somewhere in between those numbers. Okay, so it's a safe estimate to put it in the hundreds, at least, or around. Yeah. There okay. were enough people that quarantine officials could at no point in time really identify any person by name except for a few of the people that were accused of being key leaders to the movement. So did this violence end on the night of the first? Uh, no, the quarantine was actually still half standing. So Staten Islanders wanted to leave no trace behind. They wanted to erase it completely from their island. Hmm. So on the night of September 2nd, okay, with complete disbelief, quarantine officials once again saw the mob coming back down from the same hill. And almost thinking as if they were imagining it, hey, again, they entered, the iron gates were still down, so they really didn't hit much obstruction. Mm -hmm. And quarantine officials at this point kind of just almost in some ways backed down. They just kind of took care of the patients at that point. Uh, so among their first targets was that building that resisted burning the prior night, the female hospital. They wanted to make sure they got that. And... By the end of this particular night, the only thing that would be left of the quarantine would be just a single barn. Wow. Was anyone lost in the fires, whether it be patients, staff, or members of the mob? Um, there's no accounts of anyone being lost in terms of the mob, uh, despite the fact that Dr. Bristol actually handed out firearms to many of the quarantine staff that he kept in a lockbox, uh, they were very, very quickly disarmed by the crowd. Uh, all the guns were taken almost by force of, with minimal resistance from uh, the actual people holding the firearms. Mm. But in the course of the night, uh, one stevedore did get shot, uh, and it was a fatal wound. He died the next morning. And several patients were had deaths that were attributed either from the excitement of the mob activity or from possible exposure on that particular night, but nothing other than that really directly. So those patients that died were most likely died of natural causes, the diseases they had at the time? Yes. So there was no charge in the later trials that related to their death because their death was already pretty well in a minute. Okay. And for the viewers at home that might not be familiar with the meaning of the word stevedore, can you fill us in on that? Stevedore is pretty well just a ship worker at the time. They offloaded cargo from the infected vessels. They cleaned out the hulls. Uh, pretty well just disinfected the ship from stem to stern uh, to make sure that it was safe to proceed into the harbor. So these were the people that were dealing with the most infectious, inanimate material uh, within the facility. Uh, many of the rags that would be brought, anything that was clothing related, would then be heavily laundered uh, by a separate staff. So they were kind of sorting out everything and really making sure that the ship itself was safe. Mm. And so the only person lost in an act of violence during the night was a staff member? Yes, at least directly anyway. Okay. We understand that the mood of Staten Island was rather jubilant following the burning of the quarantine. Were there any kind of uh, public display scene after this? Um, there is a small account of pistols being fired into the air, but aside from that, no, not really. Uh, if there were any types of jubilance, they were kept pretty well hidden in, in, from any kind of public eye, especially since our act on Staten Island of burning the quarantine down enraged the governor so much at that time that he sent the 8th Regiment New York Militia down to put us underneath martial law. And we would stay underneath martial law for almost an entire year. An entire year under martial law? Or almost an entire Almost, yeah. He, he took, he thought that this was the most grievous of acts. Um, one, personally to me, he doesn't account for the fact that patients were removed, we were not burning them alive, and the fact that the citizens of Staten Island were actually taking care of them. They, they were putting them up in churches, they were 
There are accounts of them providing food, beverages, almost acting like an additional nursing staff to these people until they were relocated to other places like North Brother Island, Roosevelt Island, uh, to the big ones at that other quarantine sites of that time period. Uh, and some were actually placed on ships and taken elsewhere entirely. So in this burning of the quarantine, was there any sort of charges brought up on anyone uh, related to the hospitals burning down? So yes, uh, in terms of charges, there was charge of um, arson, destruction of government property, and there was also the charge of the Stevedore's murder. And who were these charges brought up against? They were brought up on what was the two people that at the time were considered to be the ringleaders of the event, okay, uh, Ray Tompkins and a person that would later become known as Honest John Tompkins. Uh, eventually he would wind up running for public office. And this was actually kind of one of his backings for it. And this trial actually took place at a familiar landmark for those who know about historic Richmond town. It took place in the third county courthouse, which is still standing today. Jeff, what was that? What was this trial like? So of all the courthouses that have been built in the Richmond town area, this one actually is the most significant in many ways in the event, in the sense that it actually, not only is it surviving, but also it saw three trials that actually grabbed national attention and the burning of the quarantine was one of those. Uh, so there would have been reporters from all sorts of newspapers around reporting on this incident. Harp there are so many illustrations from Harper's Weekly referring to the burning of the quarantine, although maybe not the trial specifically, mm -hmm. uh, as well as other newspapers. There were also Books published later on uh, detailing the minutes and testimonies of the trials, uh, one of them being the minutes, as well as a document that was called The Legal and Moral Questions of the Burning of the Quarantine on Staten Island, uh, which was equally as long of a document, not just looking at from the legal aspect, okay, but was this really an ethical situation? So it had the community pondering the controversy of it being burned down? Probably not just our community, but probably the city and maybe even the state as a whole. Interesting. What was the defense's argument during the trial itself? So as far as that goes, okay, again, we're going back to the original charter of the quarantine in 1799, which said that in the event that the government was not rectifying problems or nuisances that were being experienced by the people of Tompkinsville and the nearest town to the quarantine, then the citizens themselves could actually take it upon themselves to uh, take whatever corrective measure they, th they deem necessary. So since this had now been going on for over 50 years, we're talking 57 years by this point, they really wanted to make a statement, so they chose the most extreme option possible. And were there any noteworthy witnesses called to the stand? Um, there were a number of witnesses that were involved in this. Uh, you have the head of the quarantine, Dr. Bristol, uh, his uh, deputy, uh, Dr. Thomas Walser, uh, excuse me, Theodore Walser. Uh, and both of them were testifying how all these rules were being carried to, to the letter of the law. There's no possibility that these epidemics, that despite all these local doctors testifying, could be traced back to the quarantine, that it could not have anything to, in fact, do with, with that hospital. That it was just sheer coincidence and injector on these local physicians' parts. So it really became a battle of the doctors, almost like a who's who of the medical field in the Staten Island area. Pretty well anyone on that uh, who testified there, pretty well all of them had some kind of MD license. Hmm. So it was like a doctor's convention in the courthouse. Pretty much. That's what it really kind of boiled down to. Aside from that, you do have a couple stevedores testifying and a couple of lay people. But really, it was kind of the war of the doctors. Once quarantine really 
effective in keeping an actual quarantine as it was intended, or was it just a site where disease was being collected and then distributed to the masses? Mm. So what was the final verdict found by the jury? Uh, the final verdict was that they ruled that uh, they were innocent. Uh, one of the main parts of that was conflicting testimony and the fact that some people just saw these two gentlemen walking around, other ones saw them participating in the burning acts. There was even some light testimony indicating that they might have been intervening and trying to prevent it. But again, this kind of goes back to the idea of the chance that the crowds had put in place. Okay, save St. Nicholas Hospital, save the smallpox hospital. Okay? Almost like a, a disguise where it seems like, oh right, we're here to save it, we're here to protect the facility, but in reality, we're here to destroy it. Mm. And Jeff, what does this event tell us about the societal attitudes and common understanding of disease and medicine in the 1850s? Well, my take on it is the fact that they were battling an unknown enemy at the time. I mean, the idea of germs was still a fledgling science at that time period. Mm -hmm. And they were looking to fight this invisible enemy with very little understanding of it. But at the same point in time, there was an incredible animosity towards the patients themselves, the people that were affected by these diseases. They were still taking care of the patients. They were not killing the patients. They were not eradicating them. That was not their objective. Matter of fact, they were taking care of them afterwards while they were looking for placements and housing, okay, giving them food, allowing the church, giving them uh, blankets and so forth. Everything that they would need. The only thing being the exception to that rule is a building, okay, which had been taken away from them in this action. So they wanted to take the buildings away, but not the uh, people that made up that building or that facility. Yes, they weren't looking to kill anyone. They, were look, they didn't want to promote their suffering. They were just looking for this institution to be taken elsewhere. I understand that you have done some research uh, around Staten Island on the landmarks that uh, were erected because of this uh, fire. Yes, I mean, the quarantine has had a lasting legacy on our island. Uh, this is just a small list of some of the ones that I've put together. So up in the North Shore, okay, you have right in St. George, actually on the former quarantine grounds, okay, plaques commemorating the people that died there in some of their cemeteries. Uh, back in the early 2000s, before they even built the courthouse, they wanted to do a serious excavation over there to prevent disturbing any of the remains at that time. Uh, so they built on the side of the what, what used to be a formerly municipal parking lot. Uh, they built the quarantine on the east side of it, uh, whereas it was felt that all the quarantine victims were actually buried under the west side of it. And they erected two monuments there. One of them, which is actually pictured in this slide here in memory of the innocent victims of the Irish hunger, okay, referring directly to the potato famine uh, that mm -hmm. occurred at that time. And then also just a general acknowledgement as well in a much larger sign. Uh, you can advance the slide. Okay. okay. Talking about the Marine ho Hospital and the quarantine and its full presence on the island, okay, stating it's from being there from 1799 all the way up until 1858. Uh, and they put down a nice little grass field uh, to kind of preserve it out instead of the parking lot, which once stood on top of it. In addition to that, uh, kind of moving around the island almost in a semicircle. All right. Uh, we have Bailey Seton Hospital on the North Shore as well that would kind of commemorate the existence of it as well. Uh, Richard Bailey was the founder of it in 1801. And for a short time as well, it even held the name of the former quarantine that was burned down in 1858. So it was also known as the Marine Hospital as well, uh, as well as an assortment of other names. Hmm. Making your way slowly up the hill and deeper into the island, uh, you have another burial ground. Uh, under what is now modern day Silver Lakes Golf Course. Uh, back in 2002, they actually put up a nice plaque right outside of the clubhouse. 
uh, with a nice set of flags there as well, commemorating, again, the Irish immigrants who were trying to get away from this famine as well. Um, not to not acknowledge all the other victims from all the other various countries that had died of illness as well. Uh, continuing further into the island, even still yet further, the slide, okay, we have near the South Beach area, okay, two islands that sit offshore. Now Staten Island has been made of a continually different or a fluxing number of islands over the years. We've had islands disappear, we've had islands reappear. In this case here, we actually have two islands that if you were to look from above, have a very artificial shape to them. There's no way that these things are natural. And these are the artificial islands of Hoffman and Swinburne. And if you look from an aerial view, they're actually both hexagonal shaped. Hoffman Island, a, which is shown in this particular image, and you can see a modern day view of the island in the next, uh, where was the site of where those who came in contact with infected people were, but they weren't actually sick themselves. You can actually see some of the piers still standing on the island. Uh, the buildings themselves were torn down long, long ago uh, on this particular island. Uh, in any case, with this, uh, people that were sent to Hoffman Island okay, kind of experienced a little bit of a better lifestyle than those on its neighboring island, Swinburne, or at that time when it was initially built, it was also known as Dix Island. It got the name Swinburne Island on the basis of this was one of the earliest health commissioners of the city of New York after we became five united boroughs. If you were sent to Swinburne Island, you had a very, very grim outlook. These were, this island was meant for those that were extremely infected. Most people were terminally infected. And if you weren't terminally infected, odds are you would catch something while you were out there beyond what you already have. And you have a compromised immune system to begin with. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the building of that you actually see standing here, at least from this particular view, there's a, there's another building if you look to the right, see the roof peering through. If you're on the Brooklyn side, you can actually get a clear view of it as well. Uh, this is actually the crematorium. Uh, because death rates were so high on the island and this island was small, unlike the Marine Hospital in Tompkinsville, they did not have a coffin house. The only real option here with the fast currents, the small size of the island, was to uh, cremate the victims of disease here. And matter of fact, uh, there's actually some lore that a lot of the remains were still in that building all the way up until the mid-1960s. Wow. That is sort of eye-opening. Mm -hmm. I know that was off the coast of New York City. Now, I understand that there is uh, also a song commemorating the quarantine fire. Yes. Um, so that song it was written by Norm Peterson, uh, who many people would probably recognize as R. Cooper. He's amazing in the work that he does. He's mm -hmm. also a very talented musician, playing the fiddle as well as an assortment of other instruments, in addition to his woodwork. Uh, and I was talking to him today because I wanted to just confirm this out as to how, long, how old the song was. He actually had written this song in 1983 which when I looked at the math was actually the 125th anniversary of the burning. <laughs> so it seems like for every 25 years we do something. Let's see, 2032 is coming. Yeah, <laughs> just around the corner. Now the quarantine station's destruction represented a violent rejection of a facility designed to improve public health. Real dangers of disease spreading to the uninfected of Staten, Islands, Staten Island kindled public fear and concern which came to a head on September 1st and 2nd, 1858. The fear of infectious disease can itself be dangerous and contagious. As one scholar on the history of quarantines, Howard Markle has stated, not only does the infectious disease become the enemy, but so too do the human beings and their contacts who have encouraged, who have encountered the microbe in question. Quarantines came before and since and define the current moment in which we now live. Fighting the spread of the coronavirus, isolation and social distancing orders, 
are met with public resistance, with the quarantine being seen as an unnecessary assault on personal liberty, with economic, mo mo with economic momentum being paused, economic hardship comes to those whose jobs are not quarantine proof. What is more, the quarantine is far from equalizing as risks are gr far greater for communities of color and those working lower paying jobs. In, 19, in the 19th century, immigrants who, contact, who contracted infectious diseases were quarantined on Staten Island. Today, many of the workers deemed essential are also immigrants. One consistent theme in these threads is the vulnerability of humanity, its physical vulnerability to disease and illness, and to the societal vulnerability born of the fears of disease itself. New Yorkers, however, no strangers to difficult times, can bear witness also to the strength and resilience of their people in moments such as this. Exclamations of pride and gratitude ring out across the five boroughs at 7 p.m. each night. Gestures of support can be seen all around. Social media maintains connectivity between people in their isolation. A question many of us ask may be asking now is, how will the quarantine be remembered? Historic Richmond Town is launching a collection to preserve physical objects, photographs, and personal accounts relating to the experiences of Staten Islanders during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal is to build an inclusive collection that represents diverse voices and perspectives and to make it publicly accessible for generations to come. I encourage you to check it out on our website, historicrichmondtown.org for more information. Thank you for joining us for this virtual public program at Historic Richmond Town. Thank you, Jeff Caverly, for sharing your experience, expertise with us and being a part of this conversation. And now folks, please enjoy this original song on tonight's subject, The Quarantine by Norm Peterson and the Folk Quintet Down. ships came in the harbor the city folk would say there's yellow jack and fever take it far away that island in the distance looks happy and sublime so we'll put it there the fever there until the end of time the bitter tears of 50 years the like you never seen don't you wish you'd been there when they burned the quarantine the bitter tears of 50 years of like you never seen don't you wish you'd been there when they burned the quarantine daughter dear you look so pale let me touch your brow i think you've got the fever we'll fetch the doctor now the doctor shakes his head and says, fever's here to stay. We beg the state, but they won't take the quarantine away. The bitter tears of 50 years, the like you never seen. Don't you wish you'd been there when they burned the quarantine? The bitter tears of 50 years, the like you never seen. Don't you wish you'd been there when they burned the quarantine? Late on one September night in 1858, the men came down from Castletown and forced the Iron Gate. When all were out, they struck a match, then they looked around, good riddance to the quarantine, and burned it to the ground. The bitter tears of 50 years, the like you never seen. Don't you wish you'd been there when they burned the quarantine? The bitter tears of 50 years, the like you never seen. Don't you wish you'd been there when they burned?